This week, a weight is lifted from my shoulders as we start to dismantle the Asheville gym. I talk about planning permission in conservation areas, and I travel on planes, trains, and automobiles to see a new electric truck that's set to change the long haul industry. I'm Daniel this Asheville Weekly, episode 158. Monday morning, we're in the yard. I interviewed candidates for our media team at 7.30, 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock. And I've walked over to the railway yard and the train has arrived. It was meant to be here at half six, but it got here at half seven. 20 wagons of type one. We are not going to be able to offload four of the wagons because we don't have enough time, so they've got to go back. But that's not our fault. It arrived late. Let's get it offloaded. So the, the rim has failed on us. You're going through wheel washes every day. Is the tyre still good? The tyre's brand new almost, so it good. was put on, but not known that it was leaking. Okay, how's that happened? It caught some angle iron on site. Oh, really? There's nothing that could be done about that. That's no. a charge it to the game. This is off your N17. Non has. Non has. Yeah. And so is that one. What's this wrong with them? One day after another, they're going to be repaired. Oh, repaired, um, yeah? I've drilled the hole there, you can see the hole. Yeah. So that had a big bolt in it. That's been took out, drilled. Then that'll get stripped now. Yeah. Up, patched inside. Yeah. Refill from the outside, back on the rim. Okay. Back on to him because you want to keep them rims. Keep them together. To Take mm. the two that are good that he's using. Yeah. And put them back in stock. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. Right. I'm trying to find space for the gym equipment. Yeah. Because I need to put it somewhere, and then we're going to start dismantling the gym. What's going in your back garden? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's time to get the tires done. All right, we have a plan. We know we're going to put the gym equipment. We're going to take it and put it into a container and store it for now so we can begin to dismantle this gym later on in the week. But I need to hurry up. I need to get changed because I've got to catch a flight. That's the gym all finished up and packed away. Another one of Daniel's harebrain schemes that benefited nobody and cost everybody their mental health. When I was going through them, I realised how much they click on each other's teeth. My flight is cancelled. I've been told that there is an incident, a security problem at Hamburg Airport, and it has been shut, and they don't know when the airport is going to open again. So I'm in a bit of a sticky situation. But work hasn't stopped, obviously, on site. At the refurbishment project, we're working on the soundproofing in the loft and running cables. We're building soundproofing partitions in the loft using a 3x2 timber and 100mm screws. There's an inner and outer wall with a 40mm gap between them. So basically, we're building a room within a room. On top of Temba 2 joists, we're fitting an 18mm moisture resistant tongue and groove chipboard with a mechanical fixing, where we glue the boards together and then screw them down using 40mm twin tread screws. Turns out there was a bomb alert at Hamburg Airport. The airport has now been reopened and I'm fortunate enough that I'm one of the people who has been put on the later flight at 6.55. If that flight happens, I would have spent most of the day in the airport, but as long as I actually travel and land in Germany and get to the hotel, the filming with Mercedes starts tomorrow morning. These things happen, and as so many things are in place already, work can carry on without me, and I can work from my laptop, and I'm in the lounge, and there's Wi-Fi, so I can't really complain. We got the plans through with the small amendments for the central London project. Now, there's only a small amendment where the washing machine was. We were going to remove the divide in the wall, and we were going to make that storage area 
one area itself and we were going to add an additional door so there were two doors to one of the bedrooms one door to actually come into the room and then another sliding door which gave the room privacy if somebody from the hallway went to use the bathroom now the client had a question he looked on the plans and he saw that we had spec timber windows the reason we had spec timber windows and bifolds is because the property is in a conservation area in the uk a conservation area basically means an area with historical architectural significance which needs to be protected and enhanced. So areas which are with that jurisdiction, you have a conservation officer which you need to submit your plans to as well as submitting your plans to the local council if you're making changes, as well as if the building has a managing agent and you need confirmation from the freehold owner. So yeah, it's not easy. As this property falls within that area, generally they request timber windows. However, we have had instances where we've managed to get aluminium through. Now me personally, I'm from the new school. I prefer aluminium, but some people prefer to go for timber because it feels a lot more natural and it gives the property an earth feel. Now the client has asked why we put timber and we did it because it's a conservation area, but they've asked us if we will go for the aluminium. We could have a situation where the consultant backs it and says no. I'm not interested, you need to have timber. Then we need to resubmit it and that takes time. Or we can go straight away and just go for the timber and see if we can get it pushed through. We'll see what the client says, but thankfully the plans have been amended and now we can push on and hopefully I can get on this flight eventually. 52. Tuesday morning, I'm in Germany. Time is 7.13 a.m. We're an hour ahead of the UK, so 6.13 back at home. So I was able to check a couple of emails and speak to Terry. I did think it would be bright by now, but it's not. Anyway, enough said, time to get on the road. Ah, Mr. Michael O'Donovan has brought the newest lorry in his fleet here. It's a Euro minus six. Michael managed to get hold of this last week and he put it on finance on a mortgage 25 year plan. Congrats, Michael. <laughs> Happy that you're moving the company forward. I'll be back in London soon. So we've had a bit of an issue today. We're meant to be doing 30 loads of type one into a job and 30 loads of muck out, which is absolutely perfect. So every lorry was doing a round journey, but I had a bit of an issue with the wet weather that we had, the muck was too sticky. When we were chipping off, there was some getting stuck. And then when they loaded type one on top of it, the type one was pulling the muck out and then it was lumps of clay in the type one. So we had a big problem with that. So we ended up having to not take the muck now and only take the type one, which is only loading single ways, which is it is what it is but unfortunately now we're gonna have to probably next week if it dries up a little bit we're probably gonna have to start taking the muck without delivering no type one which is less than ideal but there's nothing we can do about it unfortunately one thing we can't control is the weather so that's what we've had to do <laughs> look at that been fortunate enough to see the E-Actros 600 right in time with the press. When it first pulled out, I thought it was the Starship Enterprise. But I'm looking deeply and I'm learning facts and figures. Now, I'm not really a man who's had electric trucks in the past, but my head is definitely turning. From what I hear with this one, you can get 500 kilometers on a full battery. And with a new megawatt charging, you can charge from 20 to 80% legal. This is my stuff, you can't say nothing. <laughs> I've got legal watching me, like watching my, so you can't say anything, this is my vlog. I can say what I, <laughs> it charges in three minutes. <laughs> it is a beautiful truck. I'm loving it, look at it. Look at the lights. It's my first look inside. Pretty similar to some of the lorries we did reviews on in the past. The interior looks like the Arctic we've done and the tipper. Click here to watch the video on the Arctic tractor unit we did. We have the video mirrors. And like I said, it looks pretty much the same, but when you dig a little deeper, they have made improvements in here for the driver experience. And there's some cool features. You can see exactly how much your battery has been charged, how quickly it's charging, the voltage at which you're charging. You can see how many miles you got left. And there's this purple square and it shows the range so based on how much power you've got that is the distance that you could travel there's two fridges which are located down here the 
thickness of the mattress has been increased for a better night's sleep. And generally the cab is very spacious, like there's a lot of room and all these new technological features help the driver have full control and full knowledge of everything that's going on with the electrical system. Now I don't do long haul travel, but 500 kilometers out of a tractor unit is like that's excellent if you're running through Europe and it now means that you don't really need to plan your journeys in the same way you previously did because when you're running an electric truck you're worried about the range the entire time so you tend to try and use the truck to do all your local work but with 500 kilometers you can stay out on the road for longer and with the megawatt charging charging between 20 and 80 percent in 30 minutes if these can be implemented in truck stops it means that electric trucks are a viable option there is of course the cost in the beginning to put the infrastructure in place in the depot and the cost of the truck itself which is more expensive than a diesel model but in the conversations i've had with mercedes today if you look at the truck over a 10-year lifespan you cut down co2 by around 82% and over the life of the truck you actually save money it's just the initial investment that you have to do in the beginning I got to chat with a CEO earlier a very nice lady asked her some questions and it's a great event and of course in the yard work continues as normal Earlier in the week, you saw us working inside the loft. Well, this is the work outside the dormer to make it watertight and protect it from the elements. There is a buildup of multiple levels here. The dormer itself is finished with an 18 mil OSB board. We then fit a breathable membrane and two by one treated battens, which are fitted from top to bottom. This makes a small void for ventilation and we screw a cement board to this. That cement board is then coated with a primer and on the ends, we put stop beads to give it nice straight corners and protect it. Then we add a base coat which is sort of like a glue called HP12 and we put mesh on top of this we let it dry and then we add more HP12 and we completely cover it and have a smooth finish finally we use a quartz primer called CT16 and a top coat called CT174 which is a silicone based product it's Wednesday morning still not in the yard still in Germany still around all these electric trucks and I'm having a look at this Eactros, not in white. As a techno fan, I still really have to get a proper look around this lorry. I've got questions about when they're going to do it in a format for tippers and what the range will be, and more importantly, the payload, because that's what's important when you're running tippers, as well as the safety and the economy, etc. But you know how it works with electric trucks. If a normal tipper is 150 or 160, and then an electric tipper is 360, and then you have to spend 100 grand putting the infrastructure in your yard, but everybody wants it one pound cheaper. How are you going to make that stack up? It's all right if you're running like three or 400 lorries and you can afford something like that, but Asheville not in a position where we can. Dust cart, again, multiple electric options. Looks like one of the refrigeration vehicles. Electric trucks are cool, man, and I am on it. But we all got to work out how to make it pay. If any of you lot know how to make an electric truck pay, or a company that's in a similar position to ours in regard to how long you've been going and the amount of trucks you've got and how you try to, you know, make ends meet and continue to invest in the business and move forward and you have managed to make electric trucks work, then let me know. Looking at this behind, which I did and hit the bell straight away, I want to point out that my sledgehammer skills, if you remember the demolition of the sticker man's house, I absolutely got annihilated. <laughs> <laughs> for my sledgehammer skills. I like to say since then, my sledgehammer skills have improved incredibly. We did have a sledgehammer champion for a while, but I am now the sledgehammer champion. You know, when you're not good at something, you got to improve. And the train has arrived in the yard. Let's get it offloaded. We've had a bit of an issue today with the 926, which is the big digger that we have around the yard. We were preparing for the train to come in because of the stock of sand that we've already got in the yard. We put the 926 up on the sand in order to try and heap it up a little bit higher. But while it was up on the heap, it went into limp mode. 
but it didn't have the power even to get itself down because the ad blue pump and the compressor have given up really probably because of the age of the machine wear and tear so we've had to get lee bear out plug into it and diagnose the fault they just sent us over a quote for the parts we're looking at about four thousand pounds for the repair bill I've asked them to see what they can do. They've given us 5% for now, so something is better than nothing. I asked for a little bit more, because obviously Daniel needs to heat up his swimming pool and that sort of stuff, so we're just trying to get up a little bit of money back where we can. But yeah, it's just one thing after another at the minute, so we have to get that machine down. Hopefully they can override it just enough to get it down and then take it from there, really. So I'm in the design area. The team in here are the ones who actually design the truck, and they're just sketching out ones that people can take with them. So here they made a model of the truck from foam, which has been milled. It's pretty cool. I'm on road in Germany trying to find a gym after a day of filming. I thought I found one using Google Maps. Here I am, but I think I'm in the wrong place. Uh, I can't speak German, but I assume that means I need to go around the block. All right, there it is, it's up there. It's a grand entrance. I'm thinking I'm going gym, I don't know, I'm going to a nightclub. Really nice gym, great environment to work out in. People who worked there were really cool as well. Made me think, I always wanted to have an Asheville gym. Growing up, I said, one day I wanna open a gym. And when I went into the working world, I carried on, I want a gym, I want a gym. But I began to learn about business. And I began to meet gym owners. Now I'm talking about the UK here, and gym owners who say, it's very difficult to make any money. Now the, the chain operators of gyms, I've known of a few of them, and I've known people who work in banking, who have to take their debts and restructure them over longer periods of time because they're not making money. Land is so expensive that gyms end up needing to be at full occupancy just to break even. And then they become part of a bigger chain and then they change hands and change hands and then a new person can't make it work. They take all the people out of the gym and just leave it so you swipe a card and go in there by yourself, which you need people working in the gym to advise. Then you go in there, no one puts any weights back, nothing's going on and you lose the whole feeling of the gym and the essence of having a gym with people helping each other train and people trying to have a structure to their lives and improve their health and better their self physically in that way or just make any improvement whatsoever. And I know what it feels like to run a business at times and struggle with staffing and have all your things damaged and smashed and lost and not put back. I've lost everything. And I think to myself, man, if you can't make it make money, and money which is gonna make a difference, or you can't grow it quickly and then sell it to a larger company, I just don't wanna get involved in things like that. It's too many challenges. I think that I'll have to focus on what I'm doing and not branch out of construction as per se. Of course, we'll continue to try to diversify Asheville and do more within construction and try and do the things within the supply chain that we go to others for. But stepping out and just going in somewhere completely new because I had a dream that one day I'd have a gym, nah. Unless there is one scenario. If Asheville were in a position and they bought a lot of land, and I mean a lot, a lot of land, enough space that we had a huge depot and in one corner of the site, if it had a separate entrance, because it couldn't share the same entrance as the yard, we were able to throw up a building out of concrete blocks with a flat roof, a very simple construction, and we made a deal with like a fitness brand, and we got the bad boy equipment in there and made a muscle man strong gym, and it, we kept it basic. And the land was there anyway, and the land wasn't being used for anything. And we charged, a fee for membership, what people probably thought was expensive, but anyone who really wants to train and knows equipment would realize that that's the most expensive and best equipment you're gonna get. A lot like the equipment when I was in Las Vegas filming uh, Building Impossible with Daniel Ashfield at the MSG Sphere. Bad boy equipment that you're not gonna find in one of those gyms where people are on the running machine reading a book or on the cycle, like swiping through social media. But for now, I guess I'll just have to use other people's gyms and listen to their tales of what they do to overcome the challenges within the fitness industry. And that's my rant for Wednesday evening, which is technically Thursday morning.
the time now is 12.42. I've got to go up to the main entrance where the trains come in. Because the shunter told me the last time that the switch for the points was a bit sticky. We do get quarterly track inspections, which you've probably seen. And we do put a bit of grease on it ourselves from time to time. So I don't know why he's complaining of the stickiness, but whatever, we'll check it anyway. We also have a bit of a problem. The Type 1 is not coming in quick enough. We're taking about six or 800 tonnes a day. We're putting it out faster than it's coming in. So stock levels are depleting very quickly, unfortunately. But we're asking for two trains of Type 1 a week. At the moment, they're not able to get us that due to other commitments elsewhere. So there's a bit of an issue, but we'll work for it. Seems to be moving free enough, so I don't know. Maybe he just didn't have his Weetabix that day. It's Thursday, and I'm at the airport, not in the yard. I'm about to jump on the plane again. I've managed to download a copy of weekly episode 156. I'm going to have to try and watch it on the plane and make notes. I'm struggling a bit. I did see one email come through. The client at the central London job has agreed the plans in full. And they said if they had to go for timber by folds, they would consider not doing any of the work at all because they've had bad experiences. When it gets wet, different temperatures, swelling, opening, closing, they've had nightmares. So we're gonna to begin to put the package together for the planning and for the conservation area consent. That should take us about a week or so, and then we will submit and we will see what happens. Time is 2222 and I'm above the yard. I'm on the road again and I'm just trying to think to myself about the best course of action with the new volumetric. We have got a lot of work to do in the yard, putting a steel plate on the flatbed, a couple of bits and pieces on lorries and the work on the volumetric. It's not a lot, but it will take time. Paul Fox has said to me they can get the lorry and they can put it in the workshop and they can do all the work quickly and spray it and do everything needed to it ASAP like get it done so we can get the lorry back and not have to take it off the road again I'm thinking about doing that sometimes speed and getting the lorry out on the road and earning revenue sometimes speed is your ally as opposed to putting the lorry out now like straight away and then I'm trying to pull it off the road to do this and then put it back and then pull it off and then, and then drivers are saying, oh, what about this, what about that? I'm trying to think of what the best course of action is. I've mapped out my day tomorrow to the minute. Work I've got to do in the morning, quickly get a little shape up. I've booked myself a car to Euston and at Euston, I have a train to take me to Manchester Piccadilly. I'm going to the hotel. I'm going to be live on the radio. I plan to jump in a car or walk around the corner and meet the sticker man at the weigh-in. My media schedule and tomfoolery going up to watch a boxing match can't get in the way of what's important or delay it in any way, shape or form. I had wished I would get some time in the morrow, some yard, some yard in the time tomorrow. Some time I'm tired to get some time in the yard tomorrow, but at the moment, it looks very unlikely, but I will be available for anyone who wants to contact me and my mind will be on what I'm doing. Forward. It's Friday. Terry's in the yard and he's under savage pressure. Toe? Uh, literally, yeah, yeah. All right, we'll try. A couple of drivers didn't turn up. Clients are screaming, want to get the loads out. He will overcome it. That he's under a bit of pressure. Just use all the redges, that's fine. Just use all the redges. All right. Hello, how are we doing? It's Terry from Asheville. And it's the time of the day when the drivers are on their break, waiting for some of them to load, but they've parked up, taking their break, and we're trying to get them out as quickly as possible to serve the jobs, not let anyone down, and make sure we keep all the work. Please. King Terry probably misses me with the amount of pressure he's under today. Then they mustn't have done. I'll have to, I'll have to chase them. I just spent the last hour trying to sort out a job which we have starting next week. We're doing haulage for a company that we take material from, but we are running that specialist material from one of their other depots to a site up in Watford area. When I was looking at the order, it came through just for haulage, a price per tonne to transport it. The opening hours of the site are like 7 a.m. we can tip to 7.40, 
and then from 9.30 we can then tip till like half three. But their depot doesn't open till 7 a.m. So it means that if we want to get an early morning load in there, it means that we can't because when they load us at seven, we can't get to the site by 7.40 to tip. It means that we'll be trying to put the tonnage in between 9.30 and 3.30 the entire day. And as we got to do 800 ton a day in there, that's no good. And what we are going to do is the train that's booked for Monday, instead of just type one, we are going to bring um, some of that specialist material in. So we'll have 10 wagons of the specialist material, which is what we'll keep in the yard. And we will then uh, be able to load all the lorries at night and we'll be at the gate at seven o'clock out of there for 7 30 and then for the rest of the day we won't collect from our depot we'll collect from the company's depot and then run the rest of the material in but breaking the back out of it nice and early every morning and running that train into the yard means that we're utilizing our railhead and we're ensuring that we get the quantities into the job what's needed so everyone's a winner and everyone's happy. The Wi-Fi is brutal on the train, but I'm doing as best I can. Currently, all is running well and running on time. Our expert is Daniel Asheville, a former model who now specializes in construction, aggregates, waste management and plant hire. He's also the presenter of Building Impossible. Hello, Daniel. Oh, what an intro that was. Thank you. Well, no, my pleasure, because, you know, <laughs> half my guests are people I stalk on, like, either YouTube or Instagram or whatever it might be. I go, ooh, that person sounds really interesting. <laughs> How did you get involved in this, this business that you're in? Well, I always wanted to build, but a very long time ago, I was doing personal training and strength and conditioning, and I saved money, and I thought that if I bought houses in East London when the Olympics came in 2012, I thought I was gonna be a billionaire. Well, I got that horribly wrong. That didn't really work out for me. But what it did do is it gave me a starting point in the construction industry where I would move into a property. I would actually live there. I would get subcontractors in. I would do a loft conversion, an extension if I could, depending on planning, full refurbishment, kitchens, bathrooms, and then I would either sell it or I would remortgage it and take the equity out and I would try to do the same thing again. After doing that for a couple of years, I managed to form a small team for myself with hand-picked uh, contractors from the companies I was using to do the work, and I started my own company in 2006. I realized there were gaps in the supply chain, and I didn't believe I was getting the service I needed. So I began to start forming companies which provided services that my construction company needed, like waste management, skips, providing materials like sand and stone, then concrete and moving on. So I began to move into these uh, business genres just to support my construction company Company, but they grew to a size where I now provide their services for other construction companies. The one big question I think lots of us have is about how to get good tradespeople. You've obviously got it down pat, but for the ordinary person like me or anyone else, what are your top tips? The first thing to always remember is if it seems to be too good to be true, it normally is. If you have free quotations from recommended tradespeople, and you can check them out and you know they have insurance, you should actually take the time to go and see their previous completed projects and speak to the clients. So speak to the client so you can understand what the process was like. But I don't think that one should go for the cheapest option all the time straight away. Listen, it's been a delight speaking to you. Thank you ever so much for joining us. That was actually quite fun. I enjoyed that. I got to stick a man in the lobby asking how long I'm going to be. But I have fulfilled my work commitments thus far. And I believe now I'm going to go to the weigh-in. There's a sticker man. Whole future and people. So it's Saturday morning. As you can see, we've got a lot of lorries parked up today. There's not really a lot happening. We've got one or two concrete lorries out on the road. So it's standard sort of maintenance stuff on a Saturday, checking wheel nuts, greasing cranes, skip lifting gear. Got the tire fitter checking punctures, changing wheels where needed, turning tires on rims. They're trying to get the yard tidy for Monday so that we're not starting Monday with the mess that we left Saturday. We've got a train on Monday of type one, so get all the bays ready for that. And Terry's talking nonsense again. I'm with a sticker man and I'm driving. 
because he has a bad back. I spent a lot of time this morning on the computer again, on the laptop, working, working. I spoke to Terry in the yard, there's plenty going on. But I'll tell you what, yeah, the sticker man today on the last few days, by the time this comes out, the KSI fight has already happened. But the Lamborghini, that was my friend here. If you know what this man went through to get that car into the stadium and all the work he's had to do. Hopefully JJ gets the result tonight. Who knows what's gonna happen, but shout out to this man. And by this time your video will be out, won't it? Yeah, video will be out. So you can check that out if you wanna click here. You can see how that car came about, how we got it into the stadium. Yeah, it was crazy. It's to do with JJ, KSI's walkout. Yeah, it was, it was mad, crazy. Also click here to watch the video when we did his YouTube room. But this is like this. I can't wait to see what's gonna happen later. The weekend is very tiring. He, Yanni's flat out on his bits, I'm flat out on my bits. And I, I've got one eye on tomorrow morning because weekly's coming out. I think that for now, that's gonna be it because there's so much that's gonna be going on later. We're gonna have to shower, get changed, and we're gonna go out and have to make it happen. But one thing, I got a question. Did you catch up with Building Impossible yet? Yes, my best episode for me was South Africa. Really? Insane, insane. South Africa to me was the best episode. Yeah. The end where you're singing uh, with mm. all the crew. Mm. I love the fact that, see see Daniel's guns, yeah? You know you know when it comes time to start moving the machine and geez, that, that, you're in your element and there was like 10 other men and Daniel's just there on his own with another one just. Yeah, if you, if you watched it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Mm. Tremendous. Let's hope the rest of the day goes well. Good luck to JJ. And good luck as well to Yanni, because it's also your big night. The reveal is my big night. The car ride, right, they say, they have to pick it up on a forklift. And, yeah, Don't we... give away the video. Okay, fine. Okay, see?